Um, let's talk just a little bit more about uh, return to the office. Would love to know how your firms are uh, handling this work from home, hybrid, back to the office mindset, how it's affecting um, uh, productivity and growth of team members, and what impact it's having on the demand for office space. We already, you already said, Adam, that uh, people are taking 25% smaller offices. Uh, can, can you add some context? Let me go again? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> okay, <laughs> Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th of March, 2020, we at Trammel Crow encouraged all our employees to take their laptops home. And Saturday, some of us split the company into two groups. One group was going to come in for a week, and the other group for a week. We we're going to rotate. We did that on Saturday. And then on Sunday, we determined we're all working from home. So raise your hand if Friday, March 13th, you went into the office, and then you didn't come back for a, a few months or more. Yeah. OK, bunch of hands. It was spectacularly abrupt this transition to remote work. Um, the, the reality is people have been talking about and debating remote work for my entire lifetime. And I don't think that's really been in the conversation much. It's been more about how many days, is three days the right amount, or Friday from home, or whatever. But I'm gonna take just a second here to go back in time uh, to talk about remote work's history. So in 1972, there was a NASA engineer named Jack Niles he uh, coined the phrase telecommuting. He started working on this big complex NASA communication system from afar, and you could argue that was the beginning of the conversation. In 1979, there was a very well-read article by a guy named Frank Schiff in the Washington Post titled, Working from Home Can Save Gasoline. <laughs> so think about all the things that we talk about with working from home, and when it started, that was one conversation uh, and in that, by the way, he coined the phrase flex space. Um, in that same year, 1979, I believe the real pioneer of, of remote work from the corporate side was IBM. They had this big mainframe in Silicon Valley that they wanted to relieve some pressure on. They wanted to relieve pressure on a computer, right? So same year as the gasoline comment, they had an experiment. They went to five employees and put these green screen terminals in their homes to relieve pressure on this computer. And it worked and it was productive. And by 1983, they had 2,000 employees working remote, and in 09, there was a report saying that 40% of their 386,000 employees in 173 countries were working remotely. So they showed they were in. And then in 2017, they made news demanding thousands of employees come back to the office if they wanted to stay at the company. And in that time frame, Yahoo, who I believe was another one of the big pioneers, made a lot of news in 2013 when Marissa Mayer, a CEO who had come from Google, banned remote work. And Yahoo was one that a few years earlier said everyone can work from all, for, forever, okay? So that that's, was a while ago. If you look at today, I don't know if anybody read yesterday, there was an article on Salesforce COO saying they've looked at the data, their employees are less productive working from home. They are now going to require their sales and service people to come in, uh, I think it was four days a week. Last week, the journal had an article on USAA down in San Antonio saying a lot of their people are going to need to come in three days a week. Amazon's been out with that three-day-a-week comment. I think Disney's at four. So we can talk about how many days, but I, I think there's really just an evolution of the conversation. Um, when you look at the data of just where we are today as a country, there's a company called Castle Systems that secures space, so they track their fobs coming in. The country for their buildings, which is a lot, uh, is back in a little less than half of what we were in 2019. Dallas, Houston, Austin, Texas is a little more than half, but still a long way from where we were pre-pandemic. Trammell Crow, I, I may, maybe I should ask Table 10, I'd, I'd say we're the same as we were in terms of the way we work um, pre-pandemic, and we have been for, I don't want to say years, but probably at least over a year. Um, so when I think about what you do, what's the function, and how are you most productive, if you're personally productive, you're talking about writing from home, if, if you have a job where you, you just need to focus and, and work by yourself, I think it could be argued that if you come into the office, you could be less productive because everybody else is a distraction. If collaboration and teamwork is important, so call that proximity productivity, if your productivity is going to go up 
in my opinion, because of those two things primarily, collaboration and, and learning, because you're proximate to others, then you're gonna be better off in the office. And looking at this crowd and knowing some of you, I think you're all gonna be more productive in the office because you collaborate and you wanna learn and you wanna teach others. Um, so when um, we think about, hey, where are we going, some of the things we can look at is we can look abroad to Europe and Asia. They're back in the office more than we are compared to before the pandemic. There's, there's reasons like smaller homes, shorter commutes, that collaborative um, culture that, that they may have. So I believe we're still trending slowly. We're gonna keep coming back into the office. Um, but as, as we think about who, who's best to be working from home, I'd think about what do they do, what industry they're in. And I'll, I'll end with, this is, this is not, by the way, nothing I'm saying is Trammell Crow company talking. These are just all my personal views. M my belief is from watching what happened during the dot-com bubble bursting, and then both from Houston and Dallas, because I kind of transitioned through the Great Recession, this, I don't want to say silver lining. If there's a downturn that is mo worse than most people think, and I believe there will be a downturn worse than most people think, I believe there will be a lot more people coming back into the office, a reversion to the mean, so to speak, and, um, and, and we'll see. I think that's the only thing I can think of that's gonna be a real driver to move the needle on how many people come back into the office is, is um, that employee, for a variety of reasons, wanting to come back in more. Hmm. What are your thoughts, Michael? Uh, that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, um, first of all, we don't know the answer to this question at all. And, and honestly, it has been taxing to daily talk about this for the last 18 months. And we're going to daily talk about it. For, we're going to negotiate this every day for the next four years while we figure it out. Uh, our customers don't know the answer to this. Um, but I, I would say you've got kind of two competing forces here. You've got what I'll call technology. Uh, there's a lot of layers of that, which would... Uh, submit you can be productive from anywhere uh, versus what I'll call anthropology, which is the human animal for 5,000 years has been gathering around a fire because we're biologically driven to social interactions that not only cause meaning for us, it's how you like make a wheel, you know, 5,000 years ago by, you know, collaborating with somebody else, right? Um, so I think you've got these two competing forces. Um, there's a lot of noise in between. Uh, what I would say is this, is if you're in the production side of our business, Adam and I have been living in the hybrid world for 20 years, right? And instead of working from home, we were working from an airport, we were working from a Starbucks, we were work wherever we were on the road, we were in between meetings, and so we stayed uptown or, or up north in between our meetings because technology allowed us to do it then and you were productive. Uh, we still had an office, uh, but we, we only used it part of the time. So um, I actually, you know, we, we work really hard to inspire customers to flourish, and I really feel for them, honestly. They're really struggling with what is the right thing to do. I have yet to see, everybody asks the question about productivity. Honestly, I've yet to see somebody have an actual study that you could rely on that measures the productivity. And it, maybe it's out there, and I just haven't seen it, but people talk about productivity. I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, my generation, you manage by seeing people and walking around, and so did it feel productive? And then you have a younger generation that, you know, keystrokes, they can decide what they're doing, and is that productive? Um, so th the net net of this whole thing is, my opinion is, there is a middle ground between technology and anthropology. And to your point, you know, the interactions of mentoring and, collaboration and the serendipity of innovation, where you really make money is by creating value and solving problems quickly. Um, and, and this is a complete guess, because we don't know, but in talking to our customers, it does feel like it's gonna shake out to plus or minus three or four days in, plus or minus one or two days out. But I think the trickier part is, how does that work? And, and what I like to describe to people, because this is the challenge our customers are dealing with, the, the supply chain logistics industry has been around 10 or 15 years, right? That is an entire industry to figure out how to be efficient moving a box, okay? An inanimate object, we're gonna take 15 years with technology to figure out how to be efficient to have that box in the right place at the right time. Well, now we're trying to do that with a human animal that interacts with other human animals. It's a really 
difficult equation. Yes. And so a couple of examples that are just little problems where you say, oh, let's just let anybody come in at any time they want. Well, if Sam, Sally and Billy need to work together and they're not in together, well, that doesn't work, right? That's a little bit of a duh, okay? Okay, well, let's have our finance and investments and accounting group and tell them you all be in together because you work together largely. Well, maybe we have a senior exec in finance, a female, that is mentoring a bunch of females in other groups that aren't there. Well, okay, we lost that mentoring that could go on. So there, there's, a, there's a million permutations of how it's hard to do this supply chain thing. I think it's one of the things you're seeing now that I do find fascinating is these really big companies have, a lot of them have settled on the Tuesday through Thursday. Okay, be, everybody be in the office two, three, through Thursday. And what they're solving for is this, have everybody around. The other thing we all know is, I don't want to go to the office if 20% of the people are there on Tuesday. And I happen to pick Tuesday, but on Wednesday, 80%. You, you want to be around the energy of people and the ideas and the serendipity. Uh, well, the Tuesday through Friday is interesting to me. I, I understand how it makes the logistics problem simple. But if we're really dealing with flexibility to help the human animal, what if my spouse has dialysis on Tuesdays and Thursdays? And I really want to be in the office on Mondays and Fridays. Well, your Tuesday through Thursday thing isn't really flexible for me. So it's a long way of saying I think this is a really complicated problem. I think it's going to take a long time to settle out. I do think the net net is a 10, 15, 20% long-term headwind. I think another way to think about that is, remember, there is population and job growth annually. Mm -hmm. So if this takes five to seven years to roll out 20%, how much job growth will offset that? Again, I'm not trying to be a homer about office and that this isn't gonna matter, because I think it does matter. Uh, the other thing I would say is it plays out really differently by size of firm. Uh, you asked what we did as a firm. We did the same as you. We went home in one day, and honestly, I was, I, I called the head of our IT after about a week, and I'm like, all right, I'm sorry that I've been bitching the last five years if you've been spending a million bucks a year because, like, you flipped a switch and we were going. We were working. Like, it's been phenomenal, right? And we could work. Mm -hmm. And it, now remember, in that first 90 days, it was literally triage being in the emergency room because none of us knew what the hell's going on in the world and what's going on in our businesses. And so, you know, you'd be on your morning call with your team, like, what are we doing? Everybody would jam through meetings all day long. You'd get on your end of the day call and say, what happened today? Like, it was literally like being in military, which I've never been in, but you're literally daily planning. After about 90 days, people were, it was amazing what we accomplished, but we were pretty wore out. And we, we got back to the office pretty quickly to what we'd normally been. Um, today, you'd ask what the policy is. Today, we have a, a one day a week. You can choose to work wherever you want to work from. You do it with your manager. We're not, we don't have some corporate, you know, what group's got to be around. Um, it seems to work for people. Um, I do think different jobs are different, right? Everybody immediately goes to the accountant and say, well, accountants can work anywhere. They stare at their screen all day long. And there's an element of that that's true. Um, I like to believe that our accounting group actually adds value to our business because they know the people in investments and they know the people in operations. And when we have a problem with a customer, or with an investor and we're trying to solve the problem, they understand our business and so they do a better job of solving the problem, right? And, and I've had this conversation with our accounting department. Um, guys, if you think you're a commodity, I don't think you're a commodity, but if you think you're a commodity, be careful because business 101 is get the cheapest, highest quality source for your commodity and that may be outsourcing, not remote work, right? And so, it, it'll, and by the way, there are some big firms certainly thinking about their accounting departments. I think CB is one of them. Uh, of moving that outside the firm. And so it's a long way of saying I think this is messy. Um, it's going to be interesting. We'll legislate it daily, and in five years we'll know how it played out. Yeah, it's hey, really interesting. Christine, can yeah, I just comment on that? So I thought it was interesting you were talking about you haven't seen a study on the productivity, right? And I, I just think of the word productivity as the most important word in this whole conversation. And it feels like every company is trying to declare their belief of productivity based on whether they think they're more productive in the office or out of the office. And so I think there's a couple facts, um, I believe, like technology is great from home, it's better in the office. It should be cheaper, faster, more reliable, higher bandwidth for your Wi-Fi, whatever the metrics are. Um, and that said, in your car, except for Michael, who's unbelievably efficient in the car, 
on your way in to and from work, you're, you shouldn't be as efficient. So there's a couple variables that where commutes I think really do matter. Um, but I had a conversation with a banker uh, maybe a year or so ago that is a regional Dallas banker, has a pretty big team, and he said they were tracking through their fobs who was coming in and their loan production. And the people in the office five days a week were their highest producers. So that was, and, and with that, they were trying to encourage people to come back into the office. And I think like this Salesforce um, announcement yesterday was I think whatever they're looking at, which is, I don't know, probably some algorithms that <laughs> we wouldn't understand, but I think they're declaring, hey, we believe from our studies that again, I think it just gets back to every single firm's gonna be different and they're gonna have to figure it out along the way. But this is a really important topic, so I don't, if we, can we keep on this for just a second? Yes. Here, here's the other thing I would tell you. So um, it, I, I don't run a global firm that has 150,000 people, but if you ran a global firm that was all over, lots of 50 countries, every state in the United States, when the pandemic hits and at the end of 90 days, we decide, let's get back in the office and do what we do. Well, they're dealing with different COVID policies in different countries and different states. And it's almost like, it, it, it literally, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to send our people back in. And so I think the big firms basically said, we're not sending you back in because it's not worth it to figure out all the varying policies and how we're gonna deal with it. By the way, if you remember, we went through all these COVID starts and stops, right? All the way through, I think, fall of 21. So close to 18 months. So the big firms basically were kind of forced to keep their people out of the office for about 18 months by and large, because it, it was just too difficult to manage all of the different geographies. I, I think it takes six weeks to create a habit, right? So people were sitting at home for 18 months, so they created a habit. They created a life around that, whether it was around their spouses, their workout, their kids, whatever. And so what the big companies, companies have been dealing with since, because remember fall of 21 was when everybody was coming back to the office, right? They've been dealing with, they have these habits that have been created in their employees and they're hard to break. Uh, it's not that the employees, I think, but for that 18 months would say, oh my God, I hate being in the office, I don't want to be there. They created a new habit, okay? Um, the other thing layered on that, which we all know, is we're in a 3.5% unemployment rate, and for all of you who are college educated, we're in a 0% unemployment rate. And so the CEOs also had their head of HR saying, man, don't do anything that's going to compound our labor problem. So they've been dealing with that as we went through this. Um, back to the productivity thing, and I think it relates to these big companies. I used to say, when it was rock and roll at the end of 21, start of 22, when your revenues are like this, you kind of ignore a lot of other things. And you say, oh, wow, our productivity is great, because they substituted revenue growth for productivity, which are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it certainly makes you feel better when your revenues are doing great. And I, I really, I said back then, when we hit a patch of a slowdown, people are gonna step back and say, are we really as productive? Because if you remember back then, everybody was saying, we're so productive working from home, this is phenomenal. And I think they were really substituting revenue growth for productivity. Um, so I don't, I'm gonna conclude where I started, I don't think we know the answer, uh, <laughs> other than for sure things have changed. One, one other thing I will say, and this gets back to the anthropologist, we, we care a ton about our people like as human beings, like their life, like we want them to have meaning, we want them to, we think they're, by the way, if we're not altruistic, let's just say we're greedy, we think it makes them better for the firm, even though we think it's better for them. And so, why wouldn't you come up with a hybrid model that helps them in their life and therefore they can feel better about what they're doing and having more meaning? And frankly, we think if they're together and we're doing the right thing in the office, there is meaning to being around their compatriots in the office. Um, like many of you, we had several people get married that met at our office, right? I mean, it's just, it's just part of your life. I mean, if you're gonna spend 40 of your waking hours working somewhere, um, I would tell you also, I, you know, we have a mental health crisis in our country. Yeah. Certainly working at home in your apartment by yourself is probably not good for your mental health. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some other dynamics that we're gonna, is gonna flow through that we just don't know the, the end game yet. And, and I'm sorry to keep on this, but one thing, one thing that I think is interesting that we found at Trimmel Crow, and so for all the, you know, the, the leaders in the room that, that have companies or teams or whatever that are thinking about this for them, one of the things we were thinking about is we truly believe we're better together at the Trimmel Crow company that we want to get back in. We enabled our market leaders to set the policy. We've got 20 offices in the US. They all said, come on back. Um, but what we did, which to me is is more um, getting to, to Michael's comment about everybody's different and has their own circumstances. What we said was, 
let's find a solution to every reason not to come in. So there, we have an office in the Northeast and we had um, a really long commute for one employee. And I said, okay, well, let's talk about that. What if you came in at 10 a.m.? Does that, is the commute less? Oh yeah, it's less than half the time. It goes from an hour and 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Would you rather come in at 10? Yeah, great, come in at 10. That's it, hard stop, we don't even need to talk. Well, what about when I go home? I don't know, is three better? Is seven better? You, you pick, but having you there, the, the, for that one, it was if you're there from 10 to three, that's better than you not being there. Even with not that productive time in the car, we really, that's how strongly we believe in it. So I think that conversation has been ongoing. The employees in the past, I, I think the employers, broadly speaking, weren't as receptive to making, to being flexible in that regard to the dialysis or the commute or whatever the case may be. I, I think the, um, the savviest employers going forward are gonna find those exceptions for, for literally every single employee. Agreed. The, the way this also rolls through to real estate is what he talked about is mm -hmm. uh, employers are competing with the home, right? Yeah. And so they're trying to make the office better than the home. And that obviously relates to amenities, it relates to wellness, it relates to different variations of where you can work and how you can work. It relates to outdoor interaction and options. Um, I, I think it relates to food. Uh, you know, there's an element of bribery going on in terms of trying to get the employee back. And I think the employer realizes if I do this and they realize, wow, I kind of did like being around my teammates and I do feel more productive. And by the way, I'm getting promoted because I'm getting mentored and I'm learning more and I'm having those one-off conversations. I think they feel like they'll get the ball rolling. Not Again, not to tie people to their desk anymore, but right. to create some balance. 